It's great to see you. It's good to be together. We're here to worship together this morning to worship the Lord Jesus. We're going to open our service uh, with scripture. So this is from Isaiah chapter 12. Let's let's listen to God's word together and begin to prepare our hearts as we uh, as we join together this morning from Isaiah 12. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let us be made known in all the earth. So shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One, of Israel. We have so many reasons to give thanks to the Lord this morning, and we're here to do that very thing. So I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to open our service singing, preparing our hearts to give thanks to the Lord. So let's sing together. Sing this, oh, give thanks. Oh, give thanks to the Father, spring of life. Oh 
If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Matt, and uh, we're so grateful to be together. I want to welcome you. Those of you online, welcome to you. We're grateful to have you worshiping with us today, and our prayer is that l- the Lord will bless you and uh, we'll bond our hearts together. And uh, as we just sang, we have so many reasons to give thanks to the Lord. And there's a lot going on in the life of Anchor Church. And uh, at the end of the service today, Greg's going to have a number of announcements and details, information that's good for us to be reminded of and to hear again. So we'll have that um, at the end of the service. Um, But I just want us to take a few minutes and uh, spend some time in prayer together and asking the Lord uh, to lead us today and to prepare our hearts. And uh, we open with with Isaiah chapter 12. And I just want to remind us a couple of those verses. Verse 1 says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Uh, We remember the, the reason that the Lord's anger was turned away from us was because of Jesus. Jesus stood in our place. And so let's just take a minute. I'm going to encourage you and just give you a couple of prompts. And uh, I want to invite you to just take a moment and uh, bow your head and pray to the Lord and thank him that he's turned his anger away from you because he put it on to Jesus. And you can be here today freely in the Lord's presence because of Jesus. So let's just take a second, bow your heads and uh, talk to the Lord and give him your thanks for the life of Jesus. Verse 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Give the Lord thanks that he is your salvation. Hebrews says that it wasn't the blood of bulls and goats that was given for us. It was the blood of the sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ. Give him thanks that he's become your salvation. Verse 3 says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples and proclaim that his name is exalted. Father, your name is the great name. It's the name above all others. Jesus, you are the one who has stood in our place. You took the cross on yourself. You humbled yourself. And then you've been given the name that's above every other name so that at your name, Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth that you are Lord, and that's to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we call upon your name today. Lord, we we say that you are great. Lord, you are the one who has done great things. You are the one, Lord, who has the power to save. Lord, you are the one who has the power to forgive. Jesus, in your name, there is full and free forgiveness. There's hope, there's life, there's joy. Jesus, thank you that you were merciful to us and you didn't treat us as our sins deserve, but you stood in our place. And to that, Jesus, we say, thank you. You are great and your name is to be praised. Lord, we call on you this day. We give you praise, Lord. And as we continue to worship, Lord, would you Lead us by your spirit, Lord, as we open your word, as Lee comes and shares your word with us, Lord, I pray that you would direct him and move his heart. Lord, give us ears to hear and to respond to you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and continue to sing.
give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. You give.
this heart of mine And you hold my every breath Such an awesome God So mighty So holy So wonderful Such an awesome your grace and your mercy to us. And Lord, as we open your word, God, pray we pray that you would lead us. Lord, give us ears to hear. Lord, we need your words. You have the words of life. And so we look to you today, Lord. Lead Lee as he comes to open your word. Lord, fill his mouth with your words. And Lord, may you be honored as we handle your word and we do that rightly with a humble heart. And Lord, as we hear and the things that we hear, Lord, may we leave today obeying 
what you give to us. We pray all of this in your powerful and kind and good name. Amen. You can be seated. I was muted. <laughs> All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, last night was fun. Yeah, I, I've had to tell these stories to my kids, and now they get their own back in my day story. So, <laughs> so you know, it's their first one. So maybe it'll go well. But um, hopefully, you had your coffee this morning, because now we're going to jump into God's word. Um, much more exciting, even than the fun we had last night. Um, we're gonna we're coming at the end of Philippians chapter two. Um, which has been a great, great study. It's been a high and lofty study. A lot of deep theological truths. Now we're coming down to a passage this morning that's a definite change of pace. So I'm going to read it, and you can um, follow along this morning as we look at the submissive mind and the servant's heart today. Um, this is a Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 30. So as I read... You just follow along with me. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served me, served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send, you, send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more, the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So this, as I said, is a change of pace from what we've looked at the previous couple of weeks. We get this passage about two guys, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Who were they? I mean, a bummer, Epaphroditus, it's hard to say. We don't even, can't even come up with like a cool nickname for him. I know, little E, I don't know what, what you would call him. But we got Timothy and Epaphroditus. And, you know, why is this passage here? Are we so concerned with their, you know, travel itinerary? Do we, does Paul need to stop in the middle of his theological treatise and give us some details? Well, I think this kind of passage is very, very important. And I know the temptation, and, and I'm as guilty as anybody, is when we're studying God's Word, we have a tendency to read too fast. And we get to something like this, and we say, okay, yeah, yeah, that's nice. Timothy, Epaphroditus, blah, 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 go on. What else do I need to learn? And we blow through this, but we need to stop. Um, because there's some important things going on here. He's acknowledging, you know, Paul is acknowledging the church in Philippi, who he's writing this letter to. He's, you know, letting them, you know, we have, they have needs in Philippi, and he, will, he can't go address those needs at the moment because he's in prison. So he wants to send Timothy to do that on his behalf. But he also acknowledges the fact that Philippi, while they have their own struggles, they're concerned with Paul, and so they're sending someone to help Paul. They're sending Epaphroditus to aid him, to bring gifts, probably money, maybe some resources and things. Um, and it reminds us that God's word is very personal. This 
is the most wonderful thing that we've ever been given. But it's not just a textbook. This isn't just a manual. This isn't just a history book. While it, it is those things, this is a very personal letter from God to us and from other people between them. And we learn about how God interacts with them by looking at it that way. And I know our bent here, we, we hold God's word very high, and that's a good thing. But we have to be careful not to be so eager to dig in to find the next little nugget of truth and theology that we can hold and capture that we forget the bigger picture of what's going on. We're not to worship the theology. We're to worship the God of the Bible and whom the theology reflects. Um, and so this passage lets us slow down and see these two people, these two men, um, who were praised for their sacrificial living. It's not only what God says about them, what Paul says about them, it's what he doesn't say about them. We live in a culture right now that rewards productivity above all else, right? I mean, you know, it, it worked. Your annual reviews are, what did you get done for us, right? How many sales did you make? How did you contribute to profits? Um, how did you contribute to, to customers? What are the numbers? Um, and sometimes, as we all know, the people that get the accolades for the productivity aren't always the nicest people, aren't always those with the highest moral ground. You, we, you may work with someone who constantly gets the attaboys from the boss, and you're like, but he's a jerk. You know, he's rude. He steps on everybody, gets what he wants because he talks behind people's backs, whatever, but that's not what our culture measures. Um, I mean, last night, I mean, or, or anytime you're listening to baseball, baseball is all about stats, right? All about who's doing what. Um, you know, little percentages, always joke. Baseball is a great, great profession if you can get into it. It's the only job where as a batter, if you do your job one-third of the time, um, you get a bonus. Um, you only have to hit a 300 average to be considered awesome. And that's a joke. I know it's much harder than that. But, but they're looking at stats, and you listen to these guys, and it's like, you know, well, he's, you know, Every third Tuesday, an odd number of months, when the moon is full, he's, he's going to hit the ball. And, and they gauge these things, and they reward these guys, and they go into the Hall of Fame, they get bonuses, they get MVPs and whatever based on their productivity. But again, some of them may not be great people. Um, but the Lord doesn't look at us that way. Yes, he wants us to be diligent. Yes, he wants us to take our job seriously. Yes, he wants us to work hard, not be lazy. Yes, he wants to be diligent in the things he's commanded us. And if we are all those things, then yes, we will be productive in life. But that's not what he measures us. He looks at our heart. He's not concerned what you did for him today. He's concerned with who you are, what he's able to do through you. And this is what passages like this can let us um, see and understand. Um, but to better understand why this is here, why he stuck this, and, and why the, the meaning of it. Let's jump back to the beginning of chapter 2 really quick. Let's go back um, to what Matt covered two weeks ago, and I'm not going to go into all of it. Um, but start with verse 3. We look at Paul giving this great, lofty understanding of who Christ is and what Christ has done. Um, so Philippians 2, starting with verse 3, it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we get to see our amazing Savior and what he did for us. And as we sang just a little bit ago, he, self, he was selfless, he was generous, he was mighty and holy all at the same time. He never lost his holiness, but yet he was willing to, to lay down his own interests and view others more significant than himself. Jesus was submissive to his Father's will. He set aside a lot of privileges that he had. Not that he set aside any of his attributes or glory. He was always fully God. He wasn't hamstrung. He wasn't forced to not be able to do things. He chose to lay aside some of his privileges for our benefit. He 
chose to put on a human form, which we can't ever you know, downgrade that. He, the omnipresent, eternal spirit being came and put himself in a fleshly body for us. Again, he was fully human, but he was always fully God. But he subjected himself to hunger, fatigue, um, betrayal of friends, torture, death, loneliness, all these things he, he endured for our sake. And he was submissive to the needs of others. God is the most, understatement of the century, most significant, important being in all of existence. But yet it says here, um, to count other, he counted others more significant than himself. He wanted us to be back in fellowship with the Father. And he went to great lengths in obedience to make that happen. And we can read that passage and, and Matt did a great job of explaining to us, but we can read that passage and go, okay, that's wonderful. That's awesome. I'm so glad the Lord did that for me, and it was great this morning to, to lift up prayers of gratitude for what he did and who he is. But we can look at it and go, okay, that's wonderful, but that's not me, obviously. I'm not God Almighty. I'm not a Savior. Um, he, wants, he did that, but that's not, that's not something I can do. I can't do miracles. I don't walk on water, okay? But then if we look, just before the passage we're studying today, if we look at verse 17 of Philippians chapter 2, and this is a part of what Greg covered last week, we get a glimpse of Paul and how he deals with this. Um, and this attitude of submissiveness. Um, the famous pastor Warren Wiersbe calls this the submissive mind. This point where we, we stop and, and we say, okay, I'm going to... Be submissive to what God asks me to do. I'm going to put my life in his hands. I'm going to lay aside my preferences of what I want. And my will, my life is going to be submitted to him. Jesus submitted to the Father. It says he, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, although he had it. He willingly submitted his mind and his body and his life to his Father. Well, Paul here in verse 17 says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Paul surrendered his life to Christ. He was submissive to the desires of God. Um, as we will see next week, as we continue this study, Paul became a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul became high and lofty guy as far as his religious um, circles goes. You wanted credentials? He had them. He worked hard for them. Um, he was revered. Obviously, early on in his life, misguided theologically. And once his conversion happened, he worked hard to kind of change course. He took all that energy he was devoting to um, what he thought was right at the beginning religiously. Now he's like, okay, I will proclaim the gospel to anybody that will listen. And he submitted himself to the desires of fellow believers. He said, I want everyone to hear the freeing truth of Jesus Christ. He endured um, all kinds of hardships. He was shipwrecked, as we learned earlier in this study. He was beaten. He was imprisoned multiple times. He's in prison now as he's writing this. And here he faces a possible death penalty. He doesn't get it, this go around. Um, but he says, I'm willing to be poured out like a drink offering. What does that mean? And a drink offering is, is just a liquid offering. As in Numbers 15, it's a good kind of encapsulation of all the offerings in the Old Testament, the different things, grain offerings and obviously blood sacrifices and different things. But drink offering was one of the things that was offered up to the Lord. It's when you take wine or sometimes water or milk or some other liquid and you pour it out on an altar or you pour it out on the ground in a significant place. And it's a pledge to the Lord. I'm giving something precious to me, to you, and I'm offering this this offering of sacrifice to you. And obviously, when you pour something out of a vessel, if I take you know, wine and pour it out, well, it's gone. If it lands on the ground, it's, it's you know, soaked into the, the soil. If it's poured on an altar, it's dissipated and gone. If it's poured out on an altar that's hot with fire, then it you know, vaporizes. And I get the smell of the wine, but it's gone. I mean, once you give it, it's done. If, you, you know, if I was to take this ball of water and pour it out on the ground, you could go get me a sponge or something. I might get a little bit back in the bottle, 
So I'm never filling this back up again. It's been dispensed. It's been given away. And Paul says, that's me. I want to give my life away. I want to dispense everything I have, pour myself out. I'm just a vessel. And I'm willing to, he, he doesn't know how his situation here in prison is going to go. He could very easily lose his life. We know that he probably didn't this time. But he's willing. He says, I pour myself out. I give myself for you. He's not leaving anything at the end of the day. And we look at that and we say, well, that's amazing. That's wonderful. That's, that's something to be regarded. But that's not me. I'm not an apostle. No, I wasn't a Pharisee of Pharisees. No, God didn't come to me on the Damascus Road and blind me and then teach me things. And I didn't do miracles. I haven't healed people. I'm not Paul. That's not me. So I think that's why we come to the passage that we're at this morning. Um, we look at Timothy and Epaphroditus. Two guys. Um, two important guys. Paul says, look, um, I'm going to send Timothy to you because I've got nobody like him. Nobody's as good as Timothy. Who, who is Timothy? Who is this guy? Um, well, Scripture teaches us a lot about him. He's obviously a loyal companion to Paul. But there's a lot of attributes of Timothy. We, um, it's one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. Um, I don't know. Especially the two books, First and Second Timothy, they're written from, by Paul to Timothy directly. These are some of the more personable, in my opinion, some of the more relatable letters in all of Scripture. And I've always, I don't know, attached myself to that character. Um, but we learn a lot about him. Um, Paul says, look, don't let anybody despise you because of your youth. So it gave the impression that Timothy was a, maybe a younger guy. Now, this word youth in Greek, um, be careful. It can go all the way up to, like, include somebody up to 40 years old. I'm no longer a youth. Um, so this, that's a fact. It's becoming more apparent every day. Um, but we don't exactly know how old he was. But when Paul first meets him, let's say he's in his mid-teens at that point, then by the time Paul writes this last letter to him um, in 2 Timothy, um, he's in his 30s, probably. So a real, not an old guy at the time, relatively young guy. So he's, he's a youth, and his, he comes from good heritage. His mom and his grandmother were Jewish, but they were believers, apparently. They were followers of Christ, and they taught him the Scriptures. So he was of Jewish heritage. He understood what that meant. Um, but he also understood the gospel and what Christ had done for us. When Paul meets him, um, we realize that he's a young believer. Now, we also realize that he has a Greek father. We don't get a lot of details on this, but his father was Greek. We kind of infer from this that dad probably wasn't a follower, just because they don't really mention it, and because Timothy was, he wasn't circumcised when Paul meets him. Um, so Timothy was his interesting guy in that he was part Jewish and part Greek, he could kind of walk in both worlds. You know, Paul is completely a Jew, obviously, Roman citizen, but a Jew. And so there's certain cultural things that maybe were barriers for him. Timothy could walk in both, um, which was a unique position. Um, the circumcision thing Paul felt like was an issue, um, possible barrier to some people, so they took care of that. Um, God bless Timothy. But he had a Greek father and a Jewish mom, and he was obviously Paul's disciple. It says, you know, he calls Timothy my true child in the faith. Now, we think Timothy was a believer when he met him, but they spent so much time together. He fostered that. I mean, Tim Paul talks about how, you know, I want you to fan into flame the gift um, that came through the laying on of my hand. Um, Paul obviously acknowledged um, gifts in Timothy, acknowledged God's work in his life, and spent much, much time with him. Um, Timothy is mentioned in is it, 10 books in Scripture. His name comes up in New Testament Scripture, and most of which written by Paul. Um, so he's, he's constantly mentioned by him as he's going from church to church. But we also realize that Timothy... He was fearful at times, apparently. Um, he talks about, in 2 Timothy, Paul says, look, 
Don't have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. People extrapolate on this. Maybe he was just nervous. I mean, he was, there were some times of persecution. It wasn't just go to church and preach. It was go to church and hope, you know, maybe you get flogged after you preach. Um, perhaps he was apprehensive about this. Perhaps he was nervous at times. And he apparently had some physical issues. Um, Paul mentions in 1 Timothy 5, he tells him, you know, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Um, he had some intestinal issues. Bless his heart, and the whole world knows about it because it's put in Scripture. Um, you know? And so some commentators have, have over the years, and like I said, I, I've always enjoyed this character, and I take offense for him. Some commentators have come to the, describe him as timid Timothy with a tummy trouble. <laughs> I mean, really? Just because a poor guy has some things written that we happen to know, that nobody writes about us, um, he gets tagged as maybe a little weak physically and, and emotionally. But I think Scripture says otherwise. Um, So Paul tells us, look, um, I had a little bit too early. Paul says, Timothy, has a, he's a good guy. I have nobody like him. Um, he's proven his worth. And I trust him. Timothy was a proven track record of being a faithful servant of Christ and a servant of the church. Um, he was with Paul on many, many of his journeys. And Paul left him to, by himself several times. He was... Um, left in Ephesus, Thessalonica, and then he's being sent to Philippi. Paul trusts him to be on his own. He didn't need Paul right there next to him all the time. Um, he was Paul's protege. And as I said, 2 Timothy is probably, as we figure, the last book Paul wrote um, before he was, was executed. And this idea of a drink offering comes up again. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. And we believe that was his last, some of his last acts. And he knew it. He knew that he was going to be um, martyred for his beliefs. And 2 Timothy has this sense of urgency as a book as a whole, where he's saying, you know, and, and Paul trusted in the Lord. He trusted in the sovereignty of God. He knew the gospel didn't depend on him, but yet there's this sense of urgency of, guys, you have to carry this on. You have to guard the deposit that's been given to you. You have to be careful of what's to come. And there's this sense of, hey, Timothy, my friend, my brother, my son, be strong. Be strong. Hebrews tells us that Timothy was imprisoned at least once for his faith. And like I said a minute ago, he's mentioned, um, I'm sorry, he's mentioned in 12 New Testament books. 10 of the 12 written by Paul, but he's mentioned 12 times. So he's significant. And one of, the, one of the apocryphal books, nothing we consider to be canon of Scripture, but not necessarily all inaccurate either, but one of those books says, claims that in A.D. 97, at the age of 80, Timothy was beaten, dragged through the streets, and stoned to death because he tried to stop a procession in honor of the goddess of Diana when he was preaching the gospel. And they had enough. If that's a true account, he lived a long life for the Lord, a long sacrificial life. And he was productive. He got a lot done, but that's not what the Lord was proud of. The Lord was proud of his faithfulness. But you can look at that and go, wow, that's impressive. Didn't know all that about a guy. But that's not me. I'm not a pastor, you might say. I'm not an elder in the church. I'm not a church planter. I wasn't tutelaged by, taught by Paul. Um, I don't have those credentials. So then we get to, to our buddy Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, um, you know, he's a member of the church in Philippi. We don't know a lot. Um, we see his name, which is he's named after the goddess of Epaphrodite, which is the goddess of love. Um, and so we assume that he's Greek, that he's Gentile. There's no mention of any particular position or high reputation that he had. There's no credentials, there's no accolades, there's no moniker, you know, the excellent Epaphroditus. There's no 
great things said about him per se. They must have thought pretty highly of him at Philippi. He was sent to Rome to take care of Paul. Either they thought highly of him or he missed that committee meeting that morning when they chose, who's going to go to Rome with Paul? Epaphroditus is not here. I think he would be an excellent choice. Because, you know, he goes to Rome, which, again, not an easy thing to travel in those days, and he's going to visit a prisoner, a prisoner who's on the chopping block. Um, And you never know how it's going to go in these situations. If Paul was given the death penalty, if they were decided, you know what, you've done crimes against the empire, you must go, and everyone with you is a threat. Well, in the, everyone in the immediate vicinity was in danger of suffering the same fate that Paul was going to suffer. Um, but it tells us in this passage this morning that Paul's in the process of sending Epaphroditus back to Philippi. Why is he sending him back? Well, during his journeys and during his visit with Paul, as he took gifts to Paul and as he ministered to him, Epaphroditus got sick. We don't know what that means, but he got sick. He got really sick. He got so sick, he almost died. And he did it. And Paul, you sent some, some relief there. Paul's like, you know, man. Um, I, I was, he said I was, he was relieved from sorrow upon sorrow. He's like, here I am in jail, and this guy comes to visit me, and he almost dies. I almost had to bury this guy that comes to take care of me. I didn't have to. That was good. But they send him back because the church of Philippi catches word that Epaphroditus was ill. And so now Epaphroditus is worried that his friends were worried. He's sick about his, the fact that his friends knew he was sick. He's stressed that they were stressed. So Paul's like, I'm going to send him back to you so you won't be worried about him and he won't be worried about you and everything will be good. Um, but he said, look, hold this guy in high regard because of his sacrifice. He did a lot. And then he gives us some accolades. And I, again, let's not read this too fast. He tells us some, some nice things about Epaphroditus that say a lot. What does he call him? He says, my brother. Calls him his brother because they had a common heritage. They obviously were not blood brothers. One was Jewish, and we think one was Greek. One was Gentile. But they were both children of God. They were both in the same kingdom. They had both been adopted by the work of Jesus Christ to the Father. And he had a profound personal affection for each other. They were brothers. We are a family. This is not just a gathering. It's not just an organization. You're my brothers and sisters this morning. And we say that a lot. And sometimes it's almost kind of cheesy. Where we, Hey, brother. We need to be careful and and realize that's a true statement. And, And for some of us, you know, if you don't have a lot of believers in your blood family, you may be much closer, you may be much more bonded to those here than maybe even those that you see on the holidays. God did this on purpose. He brought us together. We're to take that family seriously. When God freed us from our sin, he didn't, just, he didn't make us slaves, he didn't make us employees, he made us children of the king and of the kingdom. And then he says, he's my fellow worker because they had a common goal. They were doing something together. They were furthering the gospel. They were proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ to all that they could. They they were working side by side. I mean, we've all had opportunities and, and chances where we've been working together with something on a project. Maybe it's at home, maybe it's at work, you know, where you're side by side with somebody. You realize you don't have to carry the whole load by yourself, but you all have a common goal in mind, and there's satisfaction when that common goal is met and reached. Paul says, he's my fellow worker. They had a common spiritual effort and a common spiritual life. They were far apart from each other most of the time, but yet they worked together all the time to spread the gospel of Jesus. And it's one of the wonderful things I've had the privilege from time to time to meet believers um, in other countries on the other side of the planet. Sometimes um, where their first language is not mine. And I've sat in worship services where I did not know the words we were singing. But I knew exactly to whom we were singing. And there was a connection there that was strong and quick. 
And Paul says, he's my fellow soldier. Because they had a common enemy, a common danger, a common threat. And this is more than just working alongside one another. Most of us do a lot of work, but aren't, isn't dangerous unless we're first responders or in the military. Most of us don't feel danger when we go to work, I hope. But Paul says, look, it's not that we just have this work to do, but there's a lot at stake here, and there's an enemy that's trying to stop us, to tempt us, to frustrate us, to slow us down, to get us off track, to get us to quit. An enemy that can't defeat the Father's plans, but he can frustrate us. And they, Paul understood how critical it was to work together, and as a soldier, you take care of each other. You look after one another. You you don't leave someone behind. You watch their back. You take care of their needs. You know, we're brothers and sisters here working for a common goal and common threats. And threats come against us. And we have to be mindful of those things. And we have to be tender to those things. We have to pray for one another. We have to bear one another's burdens. We have to be mindful and sensitive of what's going on. There's, there's a lot of hurt within our body. There's a lot of hurt within each of us. And I can't fix most of those problems, and I'm not asked to. But we can come alongside one another and bear those burdens and come to our Father together. But then he kind of changes gears. He says, he's my brother, he's my fellow worker, he's my soldier. But then talking to the Philippians, he says, but he's your messenger. You sent him. You sent him on your behalf to check on me from one group of believers to another, from one church to another. You were concerned not just with yourselves and what was going on with you, but you were concerned with me. And he's your minister. He didn't just come to pat me on the head and check on me. He came to minister. Minister is, a, is an act of significance. It's a meeting of a need. Um, at the time, this word was used in, in in Greek life, a minister of Greek government was someone who did something that was important and often at their own expense. There wasn't a stipend of the government they used, but they, they, they thought it was such a, whatever they were doing was so important, they footed the bill for it. So he's doing a service of great importance. Um, he wasn't just making a house call, so to speak. Epaphroditus was coming to pour out his heart for his friend Paul. And apparently it was significant. Paul received it that way. Epaphroditus um, obviously wasn't the son of God. He wasn't an apostle. At this point, as far as we know, he wasn't even a church planter or an elder or a pastor. He was a submissive church member. He's all of us. He's us. And are we described this way? As a brother, as a worker, as a soldier, a messenger, a minister? Is this how others view us? Is this how we view ourselves? It's easy to discount sometimes some of these instructions in Scripture, but I saw this chapter as this, this funnel of the Son of God coming and, and sacrificing himself to us. And then he appoints leaders and apostles of, of, of the church at the moment and of the church in, in history. And then that person pours into others who then pours into church members like ourselves. And 2,000 years later, we sit here as brothers and sisters with the same call to be messengers and ministers, to be soldiers and workers and brothers of those around us. Nothing has changed. So do we have a submissive mind, a servant's heart? Not all the time, no. None of us do. I certainly don't. It's a struggle. It's a struggle, and it's a crazy struggle. Maybe I'm the only one, but it's a crazy struggle. Of At times, it's like I get so wrapped up in what's in front of me, and not that things of life are bad, not that baseball games are bad, not that work is bad, not that hobbies are bad, but we get so wrapped up in what's in front of us, momentarily we forget of the exalted things that we've been charged with. And so it's this fight to always keep our eyes 
on the throne and on the Savior. We live in a world that pulls and distracts us. Sometimes it beats at us to wear us down, and sometimes it just distracts us and amuses us to, to take our eyes off the ball. Sometimes it's subtle. So it's an active fight. Are we engaging in that struggle? Are we willing to be a drink offering? Are we willing to give everything? You know, sports say give 110%, which is mathematically impossible. My wife will tell you. But for the Lord, are we willing to give him all? Not because he'll love me more, but because he loves me more than he ever could. He's always loved, he's loved me as much as he ever will. That's why I give him my all. Because I'm secure in my position with him. Not to earn it, but because I have it. And are we submissive to the needs of the lost world around us? It's God who saves. It is not me. But I'm commanded to take the gospel wherever he tells me to go, regardless of the risk. In, in our day-to-day -day life, there isn't a lot of risk. That may change one day. But are we willing? Are we willing? Are we submissive to the needs of, of other believers? Are we brothers and sisters to those around us? Do we show devotion and compassion to fellow believers? Do we spend time nurturing the relationships within our church family? Because it takes time. It takes intention. Are we co-workers? Do we pursue a goal together? Do we just come in and say, hey, how you doing? Stare at the back of somebody's head and then leave and go to lunch? Or is there a purpose to what we do? Are we working to, to further the gospel together? God didn't ask us to do it all by ourselves. Are we soldiers? Do we realize the danger? And I don't say that to be sensational. I don't say that to be fearful. But do we realize there's a struggle around us and we need to lift each other up in prayer? We need to be mindful of ourselves and set up guardrails. But we need to invite others in to speak to us. We need to confess when there's things that need to be confessed. We need to let people know what our struggles are so that they can aid us and help. And are we willing to be a messenger? Do we even think of this? Sometimes it's so easy to get tribal and to get stuck in my church and your church. and We're all one family. One of the things Satan has used against us for the last 2,000 years is, is this idea of tribalism and and. And then I realize there are some that, that go off the rails and we need to be careful not to affiliate with them and there's theology that's too far gone that we need to be careful of, but we also can get wrapped up in our little pet parameters and, and doctrines that we, that we turn our backs on, brothers and sisters. Do we ever, and I'm, this was convicting when this thought came to me, do we engage the missionaries we support? I mean, we get little reports that are given to us, but when's the last time... I've reached out to any of those missionaries personally as a messenger to them, as a show of concern to them. Are we ministers? Do we give sacrificial care? And this church has many times. This is not, this is not a finger-wagging time. This is a time of reflection. You guys have been sacrificial. I've seen it firsthand. I know of it. Things that are not public and shouldn't be public that you guys have done for people. But it's something we have to always be mindful of. To put our comfort on the line. There's, um, there's a church in Santa Fe, New Mexico. St. Bede's Episcopal Church. Um, I read this on the internet, so it must be true. It, it says there's only one door going into the sanctuary of this church. And over that door is a hand-lettered sign that simply says, Servant's entrance. There's no other way in or out of that place but through the servant's entrance. When we come together, are we coming with a servant's heart and a submissive mind? And not just in here. This is the easy place. This is the place to come and get refreshment and encouragement. And, and it's good and it's important. But let's take that same mindset when we leave. The servant's exit is just as important as the servant's entrance. Let's take that attitude out there as well. Let's take the gospel wherever we go. Let's be willing to be poured out um, for Christ's sake.
Let's be willing to be an Epaphroditus um, because I think he represents us all. If you would please, let's, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all of it. Thank you for the pieces that are complicated to me and, and inspiring to me. And thank you for the pieces that are real. Thank you for the pieces that are relatable. Thank you, Father, that what you ask of us is to be submissive to you and to surrender to you. And Lord, as we go, um, I pray that this truth is not left here by me or by any of us, but that every day this week we try to be a brother to our fellow believers, that we try to be compassionate to those that don't know you. We try to be a faithful worker, a soldier, and at times we're able, a messenger and a minister to those around us. Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you for doing all for us so that we may be your children. And thank you so much, Father, for being so wise as to allow us to be together, to instruct us to be together, to bring comfort for one another. And I pray, Lord, that you bring to mind those of us in our body that are hurting and just give us wisdom on what it is we can do um, to minister and to show love. And we're grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's sing together.
The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble. strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God invite you to be seated. Greg's going to come up. He's got a few things to share with us. Or no, he doesn't. Okay, after this, whatever this is a video, um, my last announcement, go Braves. El Salvador is a small country in Central America criminal activity there and the social insecure that the family goes through makes it so hard for the families to provide and meet their uh, child's needs. I grew up in a coffee farm. I was born during a very difficult time in El Salvador. Many uh, people immigrated to the United States. When I was five years old, my dad was one of them. I remember that uh, me and my two other brothers, uh, we were so sad. Especially for myself, it was hard because I was close to my dad. I didn't understand at that time why he left, but uh, I remember that uh, it affected me a lot. During the years to come, I always uh, wondering was my dad was not there, my birthdays, celebrations, events, and all that. That affected me in a way that I started to make really bad decisions. I think that was a way for me to try to get my dad's attention again. When I was almost 14 years old, something really good happened one day. It was a Sunday morning. My brother, who was the pastor at that time at the church, he talked to us about how much God loves us. We prayed, we worshiped God. He handed out our boxes. I remember two things about my box. When I opened it, it was really good, the smell that it was coming out of the box. The other thing that I remember is uh, a box of crying. The most important thing for me that God allowed me to experience is how happy everyone was. I was happy, my friends were happy, and I remember that for a moment, God allowed me to look around the, the room and see the joy and happiness on our faces. 
how cool it was that somebody that we have never met sent us a gift. Many of us dream to go to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to people. We don't have the resources to do it. This amazing box can get us there. We can pack a box, not only with material things, we can pack it with our love, with our prayers, and we're gonna provide the local church around the world the tools that they need to go and spread that love and, and share the good news of Jesus Christ to the people. We all have the opportunity to pack a box, and this box will change a children's life. That's a pretty good finish right there. We all have an opportunity to pack a box to change a, change a child's life. That's pretty exciting that we get to be part of God's, God's kingdom mission uh, by packing a box. Maybe you saw in that video things that were going in those. I've seen a lot of, of uh, stories recently, some of the video stories of kids that really celebrate markers and pencils and crayons and, pens and, and, and just you know, things that allow them to color and to draw. And I think that's really, it's really interesting of how that becomes very transformational in their lives. So just want to encourage you, grab a box. They're out in the commons area. We've got about a month to finish this process of gathering as many of these as we can. So let's be part of this together. I want to share with you an opportunity for us to serve. You know, every week we are blessed as a body to have a tech team that serves sacrificially um, to come and to, to participate in everything that's back here that we get to enjoy and experience. And we need more. We need more of you. If you have a, a, a technical bent, you don't have to be skilled or, or experienced necessarily in video and sound and, and all of those various skill sets that are part of it. But we have opportunities for you to be part of, part of ministry through technology. And so there are all kinds of opportunities, whether they be sound or lights or, or directing camera for our online experience. You can be part of that. You can see Matt. Matt would love to talk to you today about participating in that and being part of the team. Um, we're going to have lots of other opportunities over the next few weeks to minister and to enjoy fellowship together. It's going to be a fun month, honestly, through the end of October and into November. And next week, we are excited that the Tiptons will finally be here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. So finally, they will be here. They're enjoying some vacation right now. They're uh, anticipating the close, hopeful closure on a home in mid-November. Uh, but next week, we're going to celebrate and fellowship together by eating, which most people have no issues with, I've, I've learned, uh, through the years. And we're just going to enjoy that with chili. If you guys are okay with that, we need as many of you as, as we probably need literally 20 crock pots of chili. That, that's probably, yeah, yeah, 20 crock pots of chili. So next week, bring your chili. There's a sign-up form online. And there are instructions there, but I'll make it really easy. Go to anchorgrayson.org slash chili. You guys, yeah, anchorgrayson.org slash chili. You guys can remember that. It'll take you to the form, all right? And you can say I'm coming and what I'm bringing. And, uh, and if you have questions, Teresa is going to be out in the commons area after the service. And we're going to welcome the Tiptons together as we eat and we fellowship and we get to be part of that together. And I will warn you, next week, you're going to have to wear a name tag, all right? Wow, dead silence. <laughs> we're we're going to get to know each other, and we're going to help the Tiptons get to, to know us as well. The men's pig out. You heard about that last week. Glenn shared. We're going to pig out in a couple of weeks. We're going to pig out. Um, that's Saturday evening, the 13th at 530. Guys, we're going to eat. Again, more opportunities. And ladies, there's a Creative Connections opportunity for you on November 19th, and you can sign up in the Commons area for that as well. So lots of opportunities to enjoy one another uh, over the next few weeks. And then in a few weeks, we'll be having our Thanksgiving gathering, and we'll have more on that in the next, uh, in the next few days. So lots of opportunities. Let me encourage you to be praying um, for Maureen Chapelier. Um, she has two surgeries scheduled for this week. Are you over there? Yeah, you're over there. I know you don't feel good today. I know tomorrow is something you anticipate. Would you guys, as we pray and we leave here in a few moments, would you be specifically praying for Maureen? She told me a few minutes ago, this is uh, surgeries six and seven um, over the past you know, number of months. And so 
Um, I know you're anticipating this, so we'll be praying for you. And by the way, her mom, while she's recovering, needs some transportation to some hospital, or I'm sorry, to some doctor's visits, doctor appointments. So if you'd be willing to help with that, you can see Maureen um, at the end of the service. That would be wonderful. Those are in November. Jim Faree's mom was taken to the hospital this morning. He left here, actually, to go to the hospital. So be praying for his mom. I don't know a lot of details. And, and be praying for uh, John and Lynn Hamilton. I put this on my list for them because, as you all know, they've been anticipating getting to the Philippines for now two years-ish since COVID became a thing. And things are starting to open up in the Philippines. And so we're hopeful and prayerful that that, that door would be opening for them very soon. And so be, please be praying for them. Um, there is a drop-in shower for the Palomars today with the Palomars. And I want to rejoice, too, with Karen there she goes. She's raising her hands that she's feeling so well. Looking good, feeling good, and all of that. And the Lord has been gracious through surgery and, and the waiting on that as well. And we're glad you're feeling, feeling good. It's good to have you back. Let's, uh, let's stand together. That's a lot. Um, thank you for walking through that. Thank you, Lee, for sharing the word this morning. Thank you, Praise Team, for leading. Thank you for all those who've been online with us this morning in tech and Everyone who's served today, thank you for coming to be together. There's a lot coming up. Next week's exciting. The next couple of weeks will be very exciting. I want to encourage you to be here. Let's pray together as we go. Father, you are such a good father, and we just thank you for the body of Christ and the privilege and freedom that we have to be here together this morning. Father, we, uh, as we soak up your word, as we lift our praises to you, and we give you thanks for all that you are and all that you do. Father, we're grateful. And this morning, we, just, we especially want to lift Maureen up to you. Um, for all those who are uh, part of ministering and taking care of her, the surgeons and all those who will be part of the process. Um, Father, we pray that you give them wisdom and steady hands, that you would encourage Maureen's heart, um, that you would um, encourage the whole family as they, they walk through this journey over the next few days. Father, give her peace in all of this. Um, let her know your presence in her life and um, in, in that room. Father, let... Um, would you, would you work this out so that she might have relief and, and healing? Father, as a body, give us opportunities to minister and to care and, and to love the family well. Father, as we, uh, we pray for Maureen's mom, um, God, would you encourage us to, to help um, with her needs for transportation as well, Father, that we might minister to them. Father, we are thankful um, that you hear our prayers. Father, we pray for Jim's mom today as she was taken to the hospital this morning with, without a lot of details. Father, we trust that you would work um, in that situation as well. And for the Hamiltons, as they have um, patiently awaited the opportunity to minister in the Philippines for so long, we know their hearts are there and they're excited about the doors being open again. Father, would you just continue to work through that situation so that they might um, continue to um, minister through, through what you've called them to do, Father, that they might be responsive. And God, would that be an example for us of what it means to be called and to respond um, to the ways that you work in our hearts um, as your children. So, Father, we love you. We thank you for um, being with us here this morning. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today and allowing us into your home and life. Maybe something touched your heart or there's something going on in your life that we can pray about. Or perhaps this might be the most important day of your life and you made a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Whatever it is or wherever you are in your spiritual walk, we would love to pray for you. And you can send those prayer requests to us at prayerline at anchorholds.org and we'll connect with you and meet you right where you are. We hope today has been a blessing to you and that you'll make the decision to join us again next week. We look forward to seeing you then.
Thank you.